Hello ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try and make this work in a one uh, part lecture so I'm going to go fairly quickly. Again if you have any questions see me during office hours and I'll be happy to help you out. Today we're going to cover um, the concept of electrons and atoms. To review remember Rutherford is the scientist that discovered that the nucle nucleus exists in the atom rather than the plum pudding model. He determined that the nucleus was small, dense, and positive, and stated that electrons moved around the nucleus in an electron cloud. Niels Bohr wanted to know why the electrons didn't fall into the nucleus. His model is based on the concept that electrons move as particles, and he felt that electrons move like planets around the sun, which he called orbits. The orbits are circular and at different levels, and the radii are fixed. Energy separates one level from the other, and we still use the term orbital um, in response to Bohr today. Further away from the nucleus means more energy. In other words, there's no in-between energy between the levels. Bohr models are good to use to discuss bonding behavior of the elements, and so we'll still refer to that today. Make sure that you do understand that this... Um, chart will be valuable to you in the future. Atoms with full outer orbitals are extremely stable. Those that naturally occur, occur are called noble gases because they're so stable they don't interact unless there are very specific conditions. Atoms with outer orbits that are not full tend to undergo chemical reactions attempting to fill that outer orbit. Under certain conditions, some elements lose or gain electrons to attain more stable electron around, er, arrangements, which is that of the nearest noble gas. Metals will lose their electrons and form positive ions called cations. Nonmetals will gain electrons and form negative ions called anions. The number of electrons gained or lost is connected to the position of the element on the periodic table. You will need your periodic table for this lecture, so make sure you have it out. Energy is quantized, which means it comes in chunks. Quanta is the amount of energy needed to move from one energy level to another, or a quantum leap in energy. Schrodinger derived an equation that described the energy and position of the electrons in an atom. He was kind of famous for his cat. He treated the electrons as waves rather than as particles, and this model is a mathematical solution, but not anything that you can see. The quantum mechanical model does have energy levels for the electrons, just like the Bohr model. The orbits, however, are not circular, and it can only tell us the probability of finding an electron in a certain distance from the nucleus. So we get into a whole lot of theoretical calculus in order to determine where the electron might be at any one moment in time. The electrons are therefore found in a blurry electron cloud, which is basically a probability space, saying the electron should be around here somewhere. An area where there is a chance of finding an electron is also known as the electron cloud. The principal quantum number n is equal to the energy level of the electron. Within each energy level, the complex math of Schrodinger's equation describes several shapes, and these are called atomic orbitals. Atomic orbital orbitals are regions where there is a high probability of finding an electron, and they take different shapes, and, and our orbitals are s, p, d, e, n, f. There is one s orbital for every energy level. s orbitals are spherically shaped, and each s orbital can hold two electrons. They are called the 1s, 2s, 3s, etc., based on the row in the periodic table in which you find the element. So if you're on the hydrogen helium row, so period one, there's a 1s. If you start on the lithium row, you're in 2s, etc. The p orbitals start in the second energy level. p orbitals are arranged in three different directions, x, y, and z, which is the same as the coordinate directions in three dimensions. There are three different shapes, but they all look like a dumbbell, and each p orbital can hold two electrons. So you can see if we have an X, Y, and Z, you can have a total of six electrons held in the combination of all the P orbitals. The D orbitals start at the third energy levels, and there are five different shapes, and you can see them here. Each can hold two electrons. So D orbitals total, if you had all of them filled, would hold 10, 10 electrons. And the F orbitals start at 
the fourth energy level and have seven different shapes. Each shape can hold two electrons, so that means that total f orbitals, if they're all filled, can hold 14. So here's a quick summary of the S, P, D, and F. Notice I left off E. That's because E is kind of a theoretical one that we're not going to deal with in high school chemistry. The first energy level only has an S orbital and only two electrons. So you can write it as 1s2 if you had the helium um, element, for example. In the second element, it has s and p orbitals. So your total is 2s2, 2p6. 2 can fit in the s orbital, and 6 can fill all of the p orbitals. So there's 8 total electrons found in this energy level. The rule for filling is that the lowest energy is filled first, and the energy levels do overlap. The orbitals don't fill up in order of energy level, though. There's a counting system to help you with this, and each box is an orbital shape, and each box has room for two electrons. So I'm going to walk you through this. Remember I said increasing energy as you go up in number? That's the same as going down in the periods? So the way electrons are arranged in atoms are referred to as the electron configurations. Configurations follow the Aufbau principle, which means that electrons enter the lowest energy level first. This causes difficulties because of, of the overlap of the orbitals of different energies. The Pauli exclusion principle says that at most two electrons exist per orbital, but have different spins. And Hund's rule says that when the electrons occupy the orbitals of equal energy, they don't pair up until they have to. In other words, they spread out as far as they can first, and then they start pairing up. So let's determine the electron configuration for phosphorus. We need to account for 15 electrons. So the first two electrons go into the 1s orbital because that's the lowest energy. So there's our 1 and 2. Notice the opposite signs because of the different spins. So you have only 13 more to go. Now we're going to go to the 2s um, orbital, 1 and 2, that's 4. Now there's 11 left. The next or electrons go into the 2p orbital, and you'll see here that they fill up the one spin and spread out as much as possible, then they fill up as a second. Now there's only 5 more left. So we go up to the next energy level, which is 3s. So 1, 2, 3 more left. And now you have three unpaired electrons in the 3p orbital because Hund's rule says they don't fill up second, um, the second pairs until they have to. So the final notation is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. The easy way to remember is to fill from the bottom up following the arrows. So you have two electrons there, two electrons there, eight electrons there, and then three. There are some exceptions to the electron configuration. Orbitals fill in order, the lowest energy to the higher energy. Adding electrons can change the energy of the orbital, and filled and half-filled orbitals have a lower energy. This makes them more stable. This can change the filling orbital of the uh, order of the d orbitals though. For example, titanium. Titanium has 22 electrons, so if we fill the boxes correctly, we have 1s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d2, and 4s2. Vanadium has 23, so that's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d3, 4s2. And chromium has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d4, and 4s2 is expected, but it is wrong. Because chromium is actually 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5, 4s1. This gives us two half-filled orbitals because they are slightly lower in energy and more stable. The same principle applies to copper. So copper's electron configuration is 3d10, 4s1. This gives us one filled orbital and one half-filled orbital. Remember these exceptions. 
D4S2 becomes D5S1, and D9S2 becomes D10S1, okay? And that works for the transition metals. You'll just need to remember that rule. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this lecture. I managed to get it in in under 10 and a half minutes. So I hope you have a great time. Make sure that you practice with this material because it will bite you in the butt if you don't. See me during office hours if you have any questions and have a great day.